Okay, I think I'm going to get started. So welcome and thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. My name is Stephanie Bush and I will be moderating the presentation. I work at the Halton Environmental Network, otherwise known as HEN. HEN strives to make the community of Halton a region with educated, um, educated stakeholders and best practice policies for climate change mitigation and adaptation and environmental <laughs> sustainability. We are very pleased that you can be with us tonight. Let us begin by acknowledging that HEN resides on Treaty 22 with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. We honor this relationship and thank the Mississaugas for their work and care of this land. As a community, we have the responsibility to honor, care for, and respect all the creation gives to provide us with life. This includes the land, water, air, fire, animals, plants, and our ancestors. The Anishinaabek peoples have utilized this land for millennia, and we would like to acknowledge their direct descendants, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, as the rightful caretakers and title holders of this land upon which we live, work, and conduct ourselves. We acknowledge our treaty relationship and responsibilities to both the land and these original peoples. We also recognize that this land is rich in pre-contact history and customs, which includes the Anishinaabek and Haudenosaunee and since European contact has and continues to become home for Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. And it is in the spirit and intent of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, whereby we will collectively care for and respect the land, water, animals, and each other in the interests of peace and friendship, and for the benefit of not only ourselves, but of our future descendants. And is very pleased to be offering this webinar on green homes and to provide an opportunity for you to ask questions of our speakers to better understand what makes a green home green and how we can all participate together through our homes to achieve our climate goals. Hen brings educational sessions to our community on topics related to climate change and climate action, and we hope you will find tonight's session both informative and inspiring. This webinar is being brought to you with engagement from the Town of Halton Hills, RWDI and Country Homes. I will introduce our speakers in just a moment, but first, a little about how this webinar will run. Please note that since this is a webinar, you will remain muted and without the option for video. The chat box can be used to make comments or to let us know if there are any technical issues. The questions, you should be able to see a Q&A button, and I'm gonna actually ask people if they can indicate in the chat box if they do see the Q&A option. Um, and you should have the ability to see other questions that have been posed and you can upload those questions if you also want to have them answered. And this helps me identify sort of the biggest priority questions that people want um, answers to. If you have a question for a particular panelist, please indicate which panelists you would like to have respond. And the Q&A will take place after some brief presentations from each of the speakers. Now, if for some reason the chat, let me see, don't see the question button. I don't understand why that's happening, John, but thanks for letting us know. So in lieu of that, please enter your questions into the chat box. I can certainly see that and I will use the chat as the way that we um, capture your questions and I will present those to the speakers tonight. Thanks very much. Okay, so before we get started and I introduce the speakers, we actually wanna know a little bit about who's listening with us tonight. So we have three poll questions through Zoom um, that we invite you to answer. Um, the first one I'm gonna launch here now. So all you have to do is click on one of the circles that represents your best uh, closest response. So the first question, question we have is when might you buy a new or different home? Um, and the, the options are there for you. So when might you plan to purchase a different or new home? Again, if there's some, okay, great. I see some answers coming in, excellent. Great, thank you, We're still coming in. Okay. And I'll just show you the results there so that everyone can see who's with us tonight. So a couple, few people not quite read, not interested in planning to purchase a home. Maybe you're near forever home already. Still lots of things you can learn tonight about greening existing homes, I think. Um, and then other people might be looking in the, in the future at a time when uh, these greener homes might be more available. So that's excellent. Okay, the next poll. Just a second.
Sorry, I'm having trouble finding the next poll. There it is. Okay, so at this time, how likely are you to invest in a green home for your next purchase? You can see it's working because people are answering, so thank you for that. <laughs> People who aren't planning to buy a home are probably not going to be looking at that, but. Okay, we've got almost everyone answered. Okay, I'm gonna share the results that we have so far. Very positive looking results for learning more about this session tonight. And the last one I wanted to do before we get going, maybe Janie was helping with, with the polls. Thank you very much. So the last one before we introduce the speakers, what do you see as the most significant barrier or barriers to buying a green home? So you do have an option to check more than one, but even if you, you know, to give us a better sense, what do you see maybe as your top two to three barriers even? Um, just to give us a sense of what that's about. Thank you for responding so quickly. Everybody's doing great. All right, so let's see the results. Hoping everyone can see that outcome. So extra cost is a big one for many people and lack of knowledge about the technology. So hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about that tonight. Um, and we'll check in with you again at the end of the session. So thanks very much for that. Now I'm excited to introduce you to our speakers. First, we'll hear from Brandon Law. Brandon is a technical director and associate principal at RWDI and has provided energy and sustainability consulting services to hundreds of developments across North America. So we'll hear from him first, and then from him, we're going to move to Stephen Hutchinson. Stephen has always been passionate about sustainability and has a dream of one day living free from fossil fuels. We will hear more about, from him about how about this motivation and perspective on green homes in his journey to build one for his family. And lastly, we will hear from Christian Renamato. Christian is bringing his perspective from the developer's lens since being Director of Sustainability and Customer Service Manager with Country Homes. So three amazing um, people to talk about quite different perspectives on this. And we uh, look forward to hearing from all of you, starting with Brandon. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, as uh, Stephanie mentioned, I am from a um, engineering and building science consultancy called RWDI. Um, this wheel shows all the various things we do, um, but I predominantly wear um, a hat that's focused around um, climate change, decarbonization strategies, um, energy efficiency for buildings, um, and uh, general sustainability programs that some of you might be aware of, um, like LEED and Passive House. Next slide. Um, one of the main reasons we're here to um, in town of Halton Hills, which are new as of this spring. Um, so this will be version three of the green development standards. Um, there have been, of course, two other versions in place before. Um, first started in 2010, updated again in 2014. As I mentioned, um, this new version three just rolled out in June of this year. Um, it replaces what was version two. Um, it will be applicable to all new developments and major additions that submit uh, planning applications, a rezoning subdivision or site plan control application. Um, if they trigger that, um, they will be required to um, comply with version three of the uh, green development standards. Um, and uh, I think really importantly here, uh, the town has taken a leadership position um, starting in, in 2010, um, one of the very first municipalities to roll out a green development standard um, and really wanted to continue to elevate that leadership position um, by increasing the stringency and the requirements um, in version three. Next. This is a kind of a quick overview of the structure of it. So um, it is, it's really heavily weighted towards the energy um, side um, with a, a real intention to ensure that 
the built environment um, within the town of Halton Hills um, um, is on its way to decarbonize and meet net zero um, targets set by town council. Um, so energy efficiency requirements that go above the building code, the Ontario building code, um, additional points associated with the low carbon energy strategies. And so we'll talk about some of those options um, today. Um, potable water use reductions, um, energy and water reporting and benchmarking um, to kind of increase the transparency associated with uh, new developments. Um, on the ecology, in the ecology category, we have um, a lot around preserving and reinstating topsoil, um, tree planting, um, soil volume minimums, um, making sure that we're specifying native and drought tolerant vegetation. vegetation. Um, in the real resiliency category, um, stormwater quantity and quality requirements um, and climate change resiliency considerations. Transportation side, um, transportation demand management plan that needs to be submitted as well as requirements for electrical vehicle charging. Um, and then an innovation category to kind of capture anything that might be applicable that we haven't specifically addressed within the standards itself. Next slide. When we talk about sustainability, um, we like to think of it as three different things. So there's the mitigation, there's the adoption, and there's the thriving. Uh, mitigation really today used to be just energy efficiency. Today, it's really all about decarbonization. Um, on the adaption side, um, this is what you um, have often probably heard of climate change resiliency. And then on the thriving side, the whole purpose that we're doing any of this is so that um, we can thrive um, as, um, as you know, humans in, in buildings that are comfortable um, and nice to be in, um, but also um, the ecology and the economy around us um, is also, also needs to thrive as part of this. Next slide. Next. So the first on decarbonization. So I always like to start off with some type of context here. And I felt that this is a really appropriate starting place. So just to give some perspective on the, the challenge that's ahead of us. Um, in uh, April of 2020, when most of us were doing nothing at all, we saw about a 9% reduction in global CO2 emissions um, because of all the COVID lockdowns. And now we need, now we kind of have a reference point of what's needed um, for the next decade. Um, we need approximately that reduction every single year um, for the next 10 years. And to me, that's just kind of a mind blowing thing to, to try to think about, to wrap your head around. We need that big of a disruption um, to, to every year um, in order to, to kind of hit uh, the 1.5 C uh, maximum um, that, uh, that we're all striving towards. Next slide. Um, when we talk about um, the energy use of buildings, so we're really talking about two separate things. And this, this embodied carbon piece has, has gained a lot of traction recently. Operational carbon, we're all more familiar with. Um, that is really you know, very much associated with just the, the fuel and the electricity that you use in your home. Um, embodied is um, everything that goes into constructing that home. Um, so everything from the construction, um, the extraction, the manufacturing of the products that go into it, um, the three biggest building materials being concrete, steel, and wood, um, concrete being by far the most energy carbon intensive um, out of the three, um, just because of the heat that's required to actually cook that limestone and, and make the cement and also the chemical reactions that occur from, from actually um, making cement. Um, steel um, often coming in second on an average basis, um, but varies substantially based on whether you're using a uh, basic oxygen furnace or if you're using electric, um, electric arc furnace, um, and also the recycled content of the steel, um, anyone from zero to 100%. Um, and then in third, of course, is, is wood, um, which can um, be the lowest uh, carbon intensity um, per kilogram, um, but often um, steel is actually better just from a, if you use an electric arc furnace um, and res highly recycled content. Next slide. Um, whenever we're designing buildings, um, we always kind of take this approach. So we start with a baseline performance, and this is really like the minimum that the code requires us to design to. Um, we always then try to look at upgrading the passive envelope um, as much as possible. Um, we then look at reducing 
um, our internal gains. And then only once we've kind of addressed and reduced those loads as much as possible, then we then, we then look at the, the HVAC strategies um, to meet those loads as efficiently as possible. Um, and so this hierarchy approach is, is really important. Um, and we'll go into that in a minute. Next slide. Um, one really key ingredient to um, the decarbonization strategy for um, the building sector is, is to take into consideration not just your energy use, um, but also um, the um, mix of the, the CO2 factors that are applied to electricity and to the fuel you're using, in most cases it being natural gas for heating and domestic hot water. Um, the uh, CO2 factor associated with natural gas is six times higher than that of electricity in Ontario. Um, so by switching from natural gas to electricity, you get a six times benefit. Um, if you also add in something like a heat pump, so an air source heat pump with a seasonal coefficient of performance of 2.5, that just means it's, it's 250% uh, efficient and moving heat from one place to another. Um, you obviously multiply and get even greater benefit from switching to electricity. Um, so this, this is a really key um, thing to, to consider when we're looking to decarbonize our buildings. How do we electrify as quickly as possible? Next slide. On the resiliency front, um, this is obviously really important in the news a lot. Um, what is a resilient building? Um, this, is, this is a picture of a resilient building, probably not uh, a lot of adaption considerations in that it was built right on the coast, probably an area that was prone to hurricanes, um, but nonetheless, from compared to its peers, it was a resilient building. Um, next slide. We've seen a lot of um, unfortunate examples recently. Um, BC kind of being hit the hardest and, and the most frequent, the, the flooding in the top left here, um, that's a picture from the flood just a couple of weeks ago, um, the heat dome that they saw this, this summer that saw incredible, um, incredible records being broken. Um, Toronto Islands in 2017 in the bottom left, um, big flooding in um, Toronto in 2013. That was actually right near my house and those cars got ticketed the next morning when um, that water cleared. Um, so I always make sure to use that picture, just that, that ridiculous of a situation. And then of course, Texas, um, which somehow was just earlier this year um, that they had those power outages um, and all the, all the problems there. Next slide. We also need to kind of take into consideration that our climate has changed and that um, continued warming is inevitable. So this is um, kind of a snapshot um, of Toronto. Um, so what you see here is heating degree days, which is just a measure of how much heat um, is needed to heat or how much energy is needed to heat a building. Um, we were in climate zone six in Toronto. Um, we're now in climate zone five. By 2040, we're anticipating in climate zone four, which is roughly the equivalent of Washington, DC. So just to give you an idea of we need to design our buildings differently um, than we did previously. Um, and then also the daily rainfall maximum in 166. So that was very aligned with what we were seeing um, in BC um, just last week that caused all that flooding. Um, so those are gonna be a, become a much more normal event. Next. Um, and here's just one example of why it's really important to invest um, in our envelope and invest in um, creating high performance um, structures and homes. Um, so this, uh, this blue line here that you see um, that's going down. So that, that black line is we shut off energy. Yep. And then that blue line kind of follows the temperature of that indoor code built uh, structure, code built home. Um, and you can see very quickly it gets down to, you know, five degrees Celsius within the first few hours. Um, whereas if you built a building um, according to passive house um, standards, which is a really rigorous energy efficiency standard, that's the yellow line. And you can see, so, so for several days, if there's a power outage, you could still remain comfortable in that home. Um, so I just think that's a really important thing to point out. Next. And then of course, the thriving piece. Uh, next slide. Um, so you can tell here um, which, which building was that passive house building, which building was built um, with very um, super insulated um, building envelope. And when I say envelope, that's just the fancy word for the walls, windows, and roof. Um, and then, of course, these things really impact the way that how we feel um, in our cognitive function and performance. Um, next slide. 
this is the last one and it's just to show, so this was a study done um, back in 2016. Um, the gray bars here um, show the cognitive performance of um, fairly high uh, volatile organic compound concentrations in the air um, when they tracked these, um, these people. Um, then they up removed those volatile organic compounds in that green. Um, and then the green plus is the uh, uh, also um, low VOC environment and then also higher ventilation rates. And you see the impact on, on uh, cognitive performance and or cognitive, cognitive function and performance. So it was about a 60% improvement for the green and about 100% improvement um, for the green plus. Um, so these things are really important and they do affect uh, the way that we function. I think that's it for me. Thanks, Brandon. I pass it over to Stephen. You can unmute yourself. Yeah. Hey, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, Stephen. Perfect. Um, you can just jump to the next slide. I've just got one. So, um, you know, nice to meet everybody on the call virtually. Um, happy to join and, you know, share some insights on what I've, I'm on the same path as probably a lot of people on the call are, are hoping to be on in the near future and to kind of share some insights into how that's been going, what have been the big lessons learned in this strive to, you know, ultimately live in a high performance house. Um, for, for us, for, so for me and my family, the, the goal was really clear. Um, we were at the point where we knew we wanted to move. Um, we knew we wanted a high performance house because it was really a black and white decision. Like we, we you know, I, I think we're in a climate emergency. It's only going to get worse. And we've got to make these kind of decisions now um, to preserve, you know, 1.5C and all these, all, all these other things. So for us, it was either live in a house that continues to rely on fossil fuels or completely transition, you know, cut the connection to natural gas and live purely on mostly the electricity we can generate and obviously still connected to the grid uh, for electricity when we need it. So um, we, we started this end of 2019. Um, our plan was essentially to find a house and renovate it to net zero. Um, but even to do that, um, first of all, there was, we did try looking for houses for sale that would meet our criteria, very quickly realized that that just didn't exist. Um, so we started to look at, you know, opt what's optimal. So we need to find a house that has basically good southern exposure, right? If we're gonna rely on solar for most of our electricity, we need clear southern access. So we, we quickly started looking at only properties that had nice south facing roofs, um, not too many trees, no buildings, nothing that would cause shading issues. So that was kind of step one in narrowing it down and you know had some targeted geographical locations and just kept looking until we, we found the right property. So we found it, we thought based on everything we saw, we could do a renovation to net zero. Um, but being that we, we hadn't done this before, um, we, we, we quickly kind of learned and, and faced um, a bunch of challenges. Um, you know, older homes, which is, is what we were working with here, um, this house was uninsulated. So we had all these ideas how to better insulate it. But really the best way to do it is to insulate on the exterior. So that meant an entirely new facade on the building. Um, we also had the challenge with, we, we wanted like the goal is to get to like the highest level of performance possible. And the basement was a real challenge, obviously uninsulated. Um, so what we had planned to do was excavate down to the bottom of the basement and wrap the whole house in insulation, but we weren't going to be able to insulate below grade. Um, we just either didn't have the ceiling height to add it or there's no way to get under and do it and basements lose a ton of heat. So that was something that we were focused on, um, trying to work with the existing structure 
uh, especially when, like in our case, we were changing the entire structure, um, proved to be really hard to fit, to mate old and new together. I think that's hard in a normal renovation and it's even harder when you're trying to do a high performance home. There's, there's always sacrifices that you have to make um, for places that, you know, whether it's tying foundations together or whatever it is. And what that ultimately meant was we had to sacrifice performance of the house. Um, and, and what this was all kind of adding up to is it started to get really expensive. Um, we got to the point where the renovation was not that different from starting fresh and building new. And we got really stuck on this for a, probably a couple of months uh, where we kept trying to make it work, um, but really couldn't find a path. And we did not, we, we didn't want to tear down the house. That was a big part of what was holding us back because that seems really wasteful, right? Like a big part of, um, you know, the carbon intensity of homes is everything that goes into it, as, as Brandon mentioned. So we were trying to avoid that, but ultimately determines that if we wanted the performance that we were striving for, um, the best option was to start from scratch and do it properly. Um, and as part of that decision, we also, made the decision to try and do this carbon neutral. So there's a lot of talk about building net zero, right? Your energy balance on an annual basis is zero, um, but less talk about the embodied carbon that goes into building these homes. Um, so we, we were planning to basically count the carbon that goes into the new house and we're gonna offset all of that carbon, whatever that is, if it's a hundred metric tons, whatever that number is, we're going to offset that through most likely a reforestation program, maybe with the conservation authority um, to offset whatever was used to build the house. Um, so when we got to that stage, it was really, I, I think one challenge is finding professionals. Um, like this is a, we're in, I'd say the infancy stage in Canada in green home building. So um, it did take quite a bit of time to find the right people to work with, whether that's architects or mechanical designers or contractors. Um, like we went through the Canadian Home Builders Association because a lot of contractors are starting to get certified to net zero for new homes or, or renos. And the response we actually got was, we can't really recommend anybody to you because nobody has enough experience. They did recommend one person to us who geographically couldn't do our project. So it was really challenging to find the right people. So that is something that I'd strongly advise that you start to focus on really early because expect that will take some time. Um, and then we've been making decisions for the project really from like first, a first principles approach. So simple structure, you know, don't do a bunch of fancy features, right? The most efficient structure is basically a cube. Um, so we tried to stick to that as best we can. And we knew we needed a lot of solar. Um, in part, we want to run the house off electricity plus energy storage, but also um, power both of our cars, um, which are electric off our solar system. So we decided, we knew we needed a big roof. So we said, we want a simple structure and a big roof. And we kind of let those decisions um, happen first, which would then dictate the design afterwards. Um, we decided very early on, like there's going to be no fossil fuels. So we've cut our connection to, to Enbridge for natural gas, uh, plan to use a air source heat pump to water, um, like a radiant system, because again, that's the most efficient way to use, to move energy, um, in the space and also focus a lot on sustainable building materials, right? Like brick like the default is build a brick house, but like brick has a lot of embodied carbon in it. Um, so we, we decided to go metal because metal is highly recycled. It's a highly recycled product. It's recyclable when it comes to the end of its useful life. And we've kind of carried that throughout the project. So like what is the least carbon intensive products that we can find? Once we know what those are, we design those into the house. Um, 
act with the goal to ultimately get to kind of the lowest embodied carbon for the project um, as possible. So we're still working on it. Um, we, we are essentially design complete in permits and we hope to start construction um, in January. And, you know, we'll see. I, I think we've got all the energy modeling done. And one of the big questions is how accurate are the models? And we wanna compare that to real life and see basically how, how well they were able to predict the actual energy use of the building. I think, I think I'll stop there and then happy to answer questions later if I can help. Excellent, thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm sure there will be some questions for you afterwards. I'm gonna move things along now to Christian. Christian, I believe you can unmute yourself. Yeah, ready to go. Excellent, thank you. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for uh, taking the time. I think it's a, it's a very exciting and near, near, uh, near, near to my heart uh, topic. Uh, and unfortunately, I think a lot of, it's, it's taken, it's been a slow uh, progression in the production home building world. And um, I think we're, it's, you know, it's a challenge uh, for production home builders and large community builders to think about uh, building green, especially with quote unquote, the cost, uh, the big elephant in the room. But as we progress, it's, uh, it's about finding innovative solutions that are also low cost, low carbon. So that's uh, what I want to explain to you guys today, a little bit about our approach, as well, a real world example that was just been completed, uh, our discovery home. So I'll, uh, we'll get to that very shortly. So next slide. Uh, our approach, ultimately, when, uh, especially now that we've, uh, we've learned so much in the past few years, when we look at developments, is energy efficiency, embodied carbon, renewable energy, innovation, carbon offsetting. And those are, the, those are the five big items that we look at when we approach design uh, into the hol holistically into the entire subdivision, but also obviously with the envelope and the energy consumption and production. Uh, at the end of the slide, I'll also show you a look into our discovery home, which was uh, just completed this week. And uh, it's, uh, it's kind of exciting. It's a real world example that we talk about uh, that that's sets, a, sets a stage within a community. So pretty, very excited to show you guys that. Uh, when we talk about energy efficiency from a, a production home building stance, it's a, it can be challenging. There are technologies out there that allow us to quote unquote cheat. Uh, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that in a way that uh, it's not, we're, we're not relying on the drywall trades to call it fill in the holes. Uh, with the with the home building envelope, uh, when there's so many connection points, it's easy for there to be a lot of air leakage, and we know that that plays a tremendous part on uh, energy efficiency with the HVAC is uh, first and foremost. And so we uh, we use aero barrier. Uh, we've used it a multi, multi, multitude of times, and essentially what the product does is that you uh, they spray a non toxic element into the home. And they pressurize the home so that when the this element interacts with the oxygen and air outside, it uh, it hardens. So essentially, you're 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 filling in all the holes, uh, you know, with a, with a product that does that. And so we've had great success with that. But as well, we're working very hard with our drywall trade to maximize the uh, air tightness right from the construction phase. Uh, it's a uh, Again, a challenge because it's something else that the trades have to look out for, but we're, we're diligent in, um, in pushing that within our uh, construction schedules. Next, we have efficient HVAC systems. Oh, uh, sorry, I'm next slide, slide before. Yeah, so uh, HVAC systems for in terms of energy efficiency, uh, probably actually it is about your biggest load, about 80%. We're, uh, we're incorporating air source heat pumps into our technology as well as combi systems, which is a natural gas boiler and air handler, ERVs. And what this allows uh, for us is a cost-effective manner in order to, uh, that we incorporate in our home. We're, uh, we've looked at all, all electric systems. Um, at the time, they are, they're still a little bit pricey, uh, which, uh, which 
you know, it's a challenge, uh, not only just for the initial upfront cost, but the actual operating cost of these systems. So at the moment, we're, we're set on high efficiency, you know, low or call it wise use of carbon for natural gas boilers. And, uh, you know, what's out there today is actually quite efficient, which is uh, which still, still exciting, but nonetheless, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, ERVs is essential for homes. And, um, you know, we've, uh, we help moderate the monitor, the, uh, uh, the indoor air quality, but also to, for the, uh, for the humidity in the house. So the ERVs are essential and efficiency for the, for the windows. We, uh, we got to experiment with a couple of different, I, uh, I call it types of windows from triple pane, uh, to code windows, or I guess the builder special. And we, uh, we've just found a window with a, actually an exact coefficient, which I'll explain to you later. But essentially what it does is it allows the, it stops the, uh, stops the sunlight from coming in during the summertime. And uh, what, the, what that does is allows your home to not utilize or not need the air, uh, the AC is often. So just even some simple features like that, uh, that are cost effective as well, are pretty critical for a home builder to consider. So next slide. So uh, as, as uh, Stephen and Brandon talked about a little bit earlier, embodied carbon, and it's become an integral part to our uh, design approach. At the moment, there are not a ton of options for us, but that doesn't mean that we can't get creative in our, uh, in our materials. So I'd like to walk you through some of the exciting ones that we've found and we've actually are putting into practice with our, uh, with our uh, production home and actually our entire subdivisions. Cellulose in the attic, beautifully, it's a 98% recycled material. Uh, we use that across all of our homes. We've completely switched about two years ago and uh, you know, never looking back. So it's something that I encourage every homeowner to consider. And actually it's a it's cost benefit. It's equal to a pink phone in, uh, attic installation and it compresses over time. So it gives you actually even greater R value over the duration of the, uh, over the lifespan. For the above grade walls, we, uh, we're looking at rock wall. We've used it before. We used it in our discovery home. Price-wise, uh, it can be a little bit uh, out of reach for builders, but not to say that it can't be used. Um, it's a beautiful product. Again, what's nice is it's, uh, it's manufactured close to home. So when you talk about carbon uh, and the transportation element, uh, we, we do try to consider that as well when we're looking at different technologies. And this is something that excited me is the hemp bat insulation. So uh, myself, I'm a big believer in hemp building materials. I think they're uh, incredible, incredibly undervalued and underutilized building construction material. Uh, there's uh, so many options. <laughs> uh, I, I, I really, I really, I would love to get into it. I could have a whole slide, a uh, whole uh, presentation just on that. But in terms of simplicity and cost, uh, hemp insulation is something that we're considering and we're looking at building an entire, uh, at least a hemp integrated home in the near future. So it would uh, definitely keep you guys interested, uh, posted on that. Mammoleum flooring is uh, something that was a surprise to me, but is actually a heavily recycled content flooring. It's, uh, it replaces vinyl. So if anyone's considering doing a basement foundation, sorry, basement floor, or even in their, in their own home and they don't want to use vinyl, mammoleum is a great alternative. It's actually considered one of the most sustainable floorings uh, out there, which is a surprise to me, but uh, we're, we're using it and actually bring it into our decor center as options for homeowners. Kitchen cabinets, um, not a lot of options out there for embodied carbon, but we, uh, we are experimenting with hemp board. I actually have a, a little piece with me here today, which I wanted to show you as a replacement to MDF still sturdy it has uh, the same uh, if not exceeds the quality of mdf so that is something that we're experimenting and playing with now and then foundation walls we uh i think a lot of people misinterpret the fact that they need a 10 inch foundation wall when in 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 theory you don't you can go with your eight inch the thick foundation wall which i encourage anyone to talk to their architect about and you know simple math you, there's a 20% carbon reduction right out, right out the gates. And you, we all know concrete and yes, bricks are going to be your highest embodied carbon element to the home. So 
I really, really encourage everyone to stick with an eight inch foundation wall, work with the architect, work with your builder, see what you got to do, but just try to stay strong. Uh, renewable energy, um, you know, I think it's been an exciting uh, topic over the last, uh, you know, I, well, I want to say 20 years, but definitely the last few months. Uh, it's something that we've actually gotten into. Um, myself, I'm now the president of Clean Tech Canada, and we are a renewable energy provider, as well as battery storage and EV charging, one-stop kind of solution for for uh, for clients, and that's actually a pretty been a pretty exciting venture. And what we're going to be doing is actually integrating it into all of our future uh, sites. Uh, we have a site coming up in Brampton, um, 440 townhomes, which are all going to be running off of uh, renewable energy. So just product offering, you know, trying to contribute, uh, do our part as builders. We know that you know infrastructure is what we're building right out the gate. So let's try and start off on a good foot as well as have the ability to offer our homeowners that, um, that element as well. And I think it's a, it's a critical element to, uh, to you know, co building net zero, but low carbon uh, at least. And uh, so distributed energy resources are, uh, are going to be a part of our architecture. We have uh, discussions with uh, Electra right now, which are, which are exciting uh, still. We're at the infancy stage of this, but nonetheless, I see the I see a lot of this as a future, um, as a new grid architecture because that's where we're going. And um, again, we're, we we want to be ahead of the game, but we also want to be leaders and uh, be able to offer not only our clients but also other builders the opportunity to uh, allow for clean energy within their subdivisions. So next slide. Some innovation that we've uh, that we were looking into kind of spoke about earlier. So EV charging, we partnered with a company called Elocity. So being able to offer that to our homeowners, um, I think is critical. We've been doing, uh, we've been doing EV charging rough-ins for the last five years. So as a home builder, trying to mitigate any, well, trying to, trying to bring future, future-proof uh, homes to our, to our buyers, as you know, we all know EVs aren't, uh, aren't as widely adopted today, but we understand that in the next five, 10 years, there's going to be a mass adoption. And we're, uh, we're excited about that. But we're also trying to plan for that before it happens. Battery storage, we're, uh, we've looked at a few options. So there's a single home, which is uh, which we use the Panasonic Evervolt battery. It's a 15 kilowatt battery uh, price range, about 15, 20,000. And I'll, I'll get more into it in the discovery home about why we chose to uh, why we chose to install that in the first place. But ultimately, we're looking at battery storage on a community wide basis. So the integration of the solar and the battery and the EV charging, all connected into one grid, is uh, is really where we're heading. And this is where we see the future going of of subdivisions and community planning. Um, so we're we're at a pretty exciting time and a lot to look out for in the near future. Uh, the whole home monitoring, very near, uh, very critical in my eyes to uh, to understand where uh, where your home is in terms of energy monitoring because you know what we what we don't know we don't know, and so how can we how can we expect consumer behaviors to change without them having the wisdom or knowledge about what's going on in their home? So we partnered with Schneider Electric. Uh, we'll be installing energy monitors as a standard in our home moving forward, which we're pretty excited about because, again, just giving that uh, opportunity to homeowners to be having con to be in control of the energy use is, I think, a, a wonderful first uh, next step for us. The uh, the Leviton Wi-Fi can sorry one more go back. The uh, Leviton Wi-Fi connected electrical panels. This is a, a new uh, technological. Uh, placement for us where we, uh, the electrical panels itself actually uh, are Wi-Fi connected. And so when you talk about phantom loads and energy consumption, we can actually turn off those breakers right from our phone. So again, giving the power and control to our homeowners where they see fit, where they see uh, energy being uh, drawn out from their, uh, from their home unnecessary usage, they can now actually take control of that, which is pretty exciting. And one last is the Swidget, which is a full home indoor air quality monitor or automation. 
and it's these little modules that go into your uh, your electrical receptacles and uh, there's a there's a whole wide range of them i encourage everyone to look at uh, look into it it's uh, it's a new company and they've actually partnered with panasonic to offer it for uh, for homeowners and uh, we, we installed it into, into our discovery home and it was just it was a very exciting technological advancement that we've uh, we would never consider for a production home but we uh, we're taking it uh, into consideration for uh, for our product offerings down the line so some exciting stuff going on and we're uh, we're, we're just we're, we're we're really seeing that technology needs to be included uh, in a positive way but also we don't want to make it too complex for our homeowners where they don't even get to use the technology. So that's why we've curated a lot of these in order to allow uh, for easy uh, transition and easy, easy usages. So next slide. Uh, we've, again, Stephen and uh, Stephen talked about earlier, carbon offsets. Um, we, uh, for every tree, for, sorry, wow, for every home sold, we actually plant five trees for each homeowner as a part of their closing package. Uh, so far, planted 4,000 trees, which we're, we're pretty happy about, but we don't want to just stop there. We do want to, uh, and we are, calculating carbon, uh, embodied carbon for the entire subdivision. And so we're looking at what are our options for uh, a carbon neutral or carbon negative subdivision and community. And I think it's just, it's important. You know, I think it's a, a responsibility that builders have um you know what we're when we're moving forward and we understand what what's going on around us globally uh, and in our own backyard it's pretty uh it's pretty it's terrifying and so we're uh, we're just trying to do our part and this is a, a great partnership with tree canada to get that done so next slide i will uh, i'll go briefly over our milton discovery home um located in milton on our subdivision we uh we took a semi-detached home and we uh, we actually, we built a semi-detached and we compared two different building approaches uh, with two different energy advisors. So solar versus battery storage and all electric versus a hybrid HVAC system, triple pane versus double pane. And um, a great success. We're, uh, we'll have some articles coming out in the near future about uh, just really in the detail about what that looks like. Uh, I, I threw some numbers up there just for people to see, um, you know, there is a cost, uh, obviously, to uh, to going green. Some of the, you know, some would say solar is a, a an aggressive approach. Um, there are options out there, like you know, let's, that's why we actually built clean tech, is because what we do is we we put up the, we put the upfront capital cost in, and the home buyer will pay uh, through a lease over time to pay off that uh, that solar uh, array. And which again, it's it's a challenge for uh, for access to solar. Uh, for a lot of people and so we're trying to trying to help make that a reality the uh on the right side the battery storage we took that into account because we wanted to offset the uh, monetary value of kilowatts so in the tiered system so at nighttime what it does is it pulls the energy off the grid and it utilizes that energy all day and so what you're trying to do is a neutral uh, or at least a you know low low carbon home, but obviously low carbon cost, and trying to trying to out, out uh, outweigh those different factors up front capital capital versus operating capital. And the intention of this home is to monitor them for the next twelve months. So we we'll, we have people living in them uh, come December first, and uh, we're going to monitor them. We're going to monitor their energy bills. We're going to monitor their energy consumption, and compare the two homes at the end of the year, and give ourselves a real world example of what's going on and what's happening and you know how do we how do we we can talk about you know all these different beautiful things that we want to do but actually seeing it in practice and the practicality of them is a whole other story for us uh, especially home builders and so uh, we're, we're hoping that this exercise is going to allow to bring some light and shed some light on some of the different uh, elements of sustainable home building and uh, we're, we're we're here to share you know we're we're doers at country homes and we want to actually go through the motions of sustainable home building and learn from the, all these different uh, technologies of building practices and effects not only on the builder but on the homeowners as well and so what we've done here is uh, is, is we're, we're very excited about and so at, over the next yeah like i said 12 months we'll be able to see exactly what that actually comes to so next slide um consumer takeaway I, I just wanted to make it very clear for you know what are viable options for everyone to 
uh, to use or to, to take from what we've learned over the last uh, little while, especially from the discovery homes is windows, the U value of 1.5 and a solar heat gain of coefficient of 0.17. Uh, that works for us. We're gonna put the making that a standard in all of our homes. Uh, hybrid natural gas boiler air handler with an air, AC air source heat pump, eight inch foundation walls, uh, ELOS and the attic insulation, uh, smart thermostat, uh, Energy Star Appliances and uh, the Schneider uh, Electric uh, Wiser Energy Monitor. So, for anyone who's you know listening, thank you. And I, uh, I you know, this slide is particularly are just great ways to to get the ball rolling uh, for when you're looking to cons or considering building a sustainable home. Um, I think uh, you know there's there's a lot going on out there, and it's there's a lot to take in. And so I, I just wanted to simplify it as best as I could uh, in those categories that, uh, that people can at least have a starting off point and be able to trust the fact that we've gone through a lot of hard work to get to this point. Um, and honestly, like it's, uh, it's not gonna stop here. You know, we're continually evolving and continually trying to make a change in the home construction industry. And we're looking at uh, so many different avenues and so many different technologies that we're hoping to bring uh, to a commercial element, and uh, we're excited. So thank you guys for listening. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Um, I appreciate all of the information that you've all shared. We have very little time for Q&As, but I'm hoping that you gave so much information that um, people will go away with what they need to know. But I did have a few questions come through the chat. I invite everyone to continue to put in some questions, and we'll get through them here as, as quickly as we can. So um, I'm going to start, actually, I think I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see our speakers more fully um, and uh, just pop into the chat here. So John asked a question earlier. I think this was actually when Christian was speaking about the heating sources that you're using. And he's, he's wondering, why are you not looking at geothermal rather than air source heat pumps? Yeah, excellent question. Um, it's something that I have looked into in the past. I was actually looking at a community-wide uh, geothermal system, uh, actually for our Georgetown site, which uh, which included a 400-foot deep uh, pipe that went down with a substation that would pump it to a main line and then have feeder lines. Um, I think Madame's doing it right now on Richmond Hill. Uh, they partnered with N-Wave, and it's not that I'm against it. Um, the two things that stand out for me, first off, is the upfront cost, but also the the complexity of the building, uh, so the complexity of the system that's going to be included with the traditional called building methods, it's um, it's a massive change for a builder to inherit, especially on a community scale. Um, and then the second part to that is I have a challenge because in the next five, 10, 20 years, there's gonna be incredible advancements with home heating technology. And so when you install a geothermal system, you're kind of locked into that uh, from, from, what I, from what I understand and what I gather. And so, if, you know, things become more efficient or there's another system that can, you know, act more efficiently and less cost, you're bound to this geothermal system. And that's the only thing that's kind of frightened me and kept me away from looking at that, those options. But I, I, I don't, I definitely do encourage everyone to look at the cost benefit of a geothermal system, especially for a single home. Uh, I think it's I think it's beautiful. I think it's very cool. Uh, on a production scale, it's just a little bit trickier. Okay, thanks, Christian. Brandon, were you yeah, going to add something? Yeah, you know, Christian, I think you nailed all the real critical points there. It was perfect. Um, I, I think just like one thing to kind of consider, I mean, geothermal is incredible. It's a, it's, it's a great solution today. Um, there are complexities involved with it that aren't there with air source heat pump. Um, I think the biggest thing, and Christian, you, you really kind of alluded to this, was um, it changes the way that you build the building um, from a, you need to have, um, you need to think of geothermal as the battery for the building, um, where you're putting heat into it and taking heat out of it. Um, and so that, that balance needs to be there, not just for year one, but also there at year 35. Um, and so in making sure that you have that balance is really critical. And it means that you need to have um, your modeling done perfectly. Um, and it needs to make, you know, the, the model has to be, to Stephen's point earlier, the model has to be a very good predictor of how that building is actually going to be performing. Um, so it's more complex. It's great though. I mean, it's, it's you know, today it's it's 30 to 40% more efficient in heating mode. 
um, than an air source heat pump. Um, so certainly big benefits to it. If you can figure out the complexity, um, hire the right people to figure it out for you. Um, it's a great move, um, but certainly some additional upfront costs associated with it as well. Great, thank you. I'll just check, Stephen, did you wanna add anything or is that something you considered or? Okay, excellent. Um, another question that came up is, is what about lawns? So we're certainly talking about the structure of the home and the building itself, but are developers and or Stephen in your personal home, are you looking at the green space surrounding the home and, are you, and, and how might that be? Um, I guess the question was, can you get rid of lawn and plant useful plants? <laughs> sure, I, I can take a stab at that. It's definitely something we're thinking about. Um, grass is really intensive for a bunch of reasons, water, fertilizer. Um, I think there's a lot of other options to, I think, create a more, like you can add a lot of biodiversity on your property just by changing and putting different types of plants. So. I would like to have no grass at all in the future and, and plant it, but um, to be perfectly honest, I don't know how to get there. I, I, I'm not a green thumb. I'll have to get some help on that. But yeah, I think it does make a lot of sense. Um, grass is not really meant for our climates, I don't think, right? So I think there's a lot of better options out there that we should be looking into. Agreed, agreed. Native, native, native uh, vegetation and wild. Uh, wildflowers, wild uh, grain, whatever you, you're looking at, I think are great options. Uh, I wish it was something that we could just install right out the gates as a, as a home builder, but you know, I don't think we would get the support of our, of our buyers right out of the way. So uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to give, give them the option to do what they, what they, how they see fit. So uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great, great idea on all, on all accounts. Okay, excellent, thank you. I do have one other question. I invite, I, I know we're a little bit over time. I have one more question. If anyone has a really pressing question they'd like to add to the chat, please do so. Um, Irene is asking what you would suggest for existing homeowners to look at reducing carbon emissions. I think Christian threw out a few ideas, but they might be more directed for new homes, but I suspect all of you have some ideas about what um, people might be able to do in their own homes now. Um, or in the near future that might be more budget friendly, friendly, what new products or technologies should we watch for? I have one suggestion. Um, a lot of people heat their water with natural gas, um, just like air source heat pumps are getting to the point where they're efficient enough to heat homes. You can get an air source heat pump hot water tank that's um, really efficient and you can completely eliminate one part of your house that relies on natural gas for like, I don't think an exordinate um, cost. Okay. Um, windows are a great way if you have an, if you live in an older home. Uh, I think that's a, just an easy solution, quote unquote, you know, without tearing the whole place apart. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that one for sure. And, and, and making sure your attic insulation is uh, adequate because the, uh, over time, 30, 40 years, depending on how old your home is, it can deteriorate over time. So making sure that that's topped up so you're not getting any heat loss uh, from the attic. Yeah, I would just also add to that. Um, there are a lot of uh, the home rebate uh, program that's in place right now. They pay for energy audits, essentially. Um, so it's reimbursed. Um, have somebody come in and, it, you know, it really does depend. The, the most impactful measure depends on the attributes of your home. Um, and so we've kind of identified a few big ones, but um, certainly like take advantage of those programs, get somebody in there. They'll give you, you know, here's about what it's going to cost. Here's going to be the payback associated with it, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then if you move forward with those, you can continue to take advantage of, of some of the rebates that are associated with each of those. They're not huge, um, but uh, they certainly help. Excellent. Thank you. All great tips. Thank you, everyone. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat. We had two more poll questions for you. I'm gonna ask Janie to help me with that if I can't get it up and running here. I think she was more successful than me. Um, two quick questions. Thank you very much, Janie. As a result of what you've learned in this webinar, how, are, how likely are you to invest in a green home for your next purchase? So the choices are definitely likely, somewhat likely, not at all likely because I'm not convinced about green homes or not at all likely because you have no plans to move anyway. This was a good, 
just a learning opportunity for you, which is great too. You can advise your friends who might be planning to move. All right, excellent. I'm gonna just wrap up that poll for time's sake. We got some good results there. I'm sharing, there we go. Okay, and then the last poll, I see someone in the chat, John mentioned he was possibly upgrading his current home, which uh, yeah, I'm on that journey too, John. We actually just insulated last week, as a matter of fact, in our attic. <laughs> so the last question is, what is the most you'd be willing to pay extra for a green home? The, the big question, how much are you willing to do in order to have these returns, the, the comfort, the benefits to our climate, all of those great things? Um, it, I think over time, the hope is that the costs will be less, um, less different from a traditional home as the technology becomes more popular and more common. But uh, this is really helpful. Thank you. All right, I'm going to end that poll and share those results. Okay, so we've got some strong supporters for, for green home construction in our- in Way to go, today. go guys. Yes, thank you so it's much Encouraging. Okay, I just wanna offer a quick second to Michael Dean if he would like to share. I know that uh, we spoke a little bit about, or Brandon spoke about the green development standards in Halton Hills. Just wanted to give a shout out to Michael Dean from the town of Halton Hills. <laughs> Sorry to late the game. Um, yeah, no, I think thanks everyone for coming out and listening to us and, and thanks to our speakers for, for those really, really great presentations. Um, just wanted to let you know, you know, in, in Halton Hills, we are doing a lot in this area. Um, Brandon talked about the green development standards um, that we just updated earlier this year and, and we're trying to really push to be leaders in this area. So, you know, um, and so you know, hopefully we can we can help help make some of these things happen locally. So thanks everyone. Excellent, thank you, Mike. Um, thanks everyone for being here tonight and for going a little bit over time with us. We really appreciate you attending. I know there was some competition in the community for another event tonight, and of course, all of our schedules are getting busier and busier as the holidays come. So again, appreciate your time joining us. Uh, this has been recorded, so a recording will be made available online. If you can sh want to share it with friends and family, we invite you to do so. Um, you will get notification of that within the next few days or early next week. Thanks, everyone, and have a great night.